What's good, everyone? It's your boy Nazi with another video for the channel. Welcome back to the NBA Sports Zone. And we got another great Commanders Weekly live stream for you guys tonight with a guest, a friend of the channel, um, a friend personally, and Pedro Smith. Pedro, how are you doing? And for the few people out there who might not know who you are, can you please introduce yourself? Doing good, a little bit tired because usually, you know, summer, not waking up that early, but I got to wake up early to go to those, you know, training camp sessions. But yeah, doing pretty good. And yeah, Pedro Smith on YouTube posts in training camp recaps, stuff like that. Okay. Uh, well, speaking of training camp, you've been at a couple of practices over the last two weeks, and uh, I've been able to see some of the images and stuff that you posted and your blog as well. But for those of you who might not have already seen it can you talk a little bit more about your experiences at the training camp and some of the highlights low lights from the last couple of weeks <clears throat> yes yeah, so, i mean overall it's been pretty good i think the first day we were there was i don't know might have been the best day i don't know first day was yeah first time there was probably the best just because less people and it was just more it was way easier to talk to players afterwards and i thought overall first time was really good and like first time was like probably the lowest temperature. It was probably like 85 degrees. What's up, Abdullah? My guy. But I was probably like 85, 80 degrees or whatever. And they gave kind of VIP passes <clears throat> to everyone who was there at training camp the first day because it was a lottery. Um, but, um, you know, this, the last two times you had to have a pass. You had to have a VIP. You, you basically had to be a season ticket holder or else you can't go to the other side, which has water food stuff like that so like if you didn't bring water like today you're screwed 95 degrees or whatever you have nothing so that is something that like i feel like i mean i don't know that's kind of something that i just um i don't know it was okay but what was good though someone came in clutch yesterday gave me their vip pass and then today i brought my vip pass from the first time which was only usable for the 2nd of August, but I just used it anyways today. Uh, they didn't, um, didn't they check. Didn't mind. So that was good. But um, yeah, it, it was easy, pretty easy to get autographs from players and everything. Like <clears throat> I probably got like 15 to 20 autographs, got picks with a lot of them. Finally got the, I got a Terry pick today. That was great. Super, super night. Nice. Like it was crazy. Like, you know, he, I, I got a pick. Everyone was trying to get a pick with him or his signature. Got the pick, and he's like, nice to meet you, and, you know, just a really nice guy. So that was probably one of the highlights. Um, but, like, first day, probably I was just so surprised by, like, how many signatures and, you know, players I could meet, like Heineke, um, Gibson, McKissick, Chase Young, Logan Thomas, Kendall Fuller, Cole Turner, um, all those guys uh, the first day. Low light, I didn't talk about this on my channel, but I told uh, – Nati in a DM, and then I also <clears throat> tweet about it. So, oh, and I met Ron, by the way. That was another guy. But when yeah. I was meeting Ron, I was like kind of like right next to him, and he had like I don't I don't think it was his man. It was someone who worked for the team. Um, was like telling him, okay, we gotta go. Um, we gotta go to the white tent. And Ron was just you know doing stuff, and then he's like, okay, get out, everyone, get out of the way or whatever. We're going. Doesn't even give me like half a second to react and just like he he doesn't like shove me like this, but like he like gives me like a like like three or four taps out of the way. I'm like, bro, don't don't touch me. But yeah, um, it is what it is. It was fine because I ended up getting a pick with Ron, but like he pushed me out of the way where I was like right next to him originally. I was like, it took me another three or four minutes to get to him. And like that's what the annoying thing was. Like Ron was in Ron was not in a hurry. He was taking picks and signing with people. He is a grown man. He is in charge of the whole franchise, basically. He knows what he needs to do. He knows, no. like, what he can and can't do. Like, he knows if he, if he can sign a couple more autographs. So that was kind of annoying, but, like, that was probably the only negative experience I had. Oh, also got to meet with, like, fans. And, like, Rio was there the, uh, today on the first day. That was nice talking to Rio. Uh, Mark Holmes was there today mm -hmm. um, and just some other fans. So it was great. That was great. And yeah, Heine Heineke said hi to the vlog the other day. That was great too. I saw that. I saw that. Um, and yeah, that, it sucks to see what happened with the whole uh, Rivera situation and like security just coming in and sort of, you know, pushing you and stuff at training camp. I, 
luckily you still got the picture and you still had a great time and shout out to the uh, people in the chat abdullah andre 3000 this is a it's an inside joke but it's one that only abdullah finds funny uh <laughs> and, but uh shout out to abdullah for joining as well um but yeah so it's great to hear about your experiences at training camp and stuff but obviously the news of the day one of the pieces of news of the day, I guess, for the commanders was the Sam Mills firing. What are your thoughts on that firing and where that leaves our current defensive line group? Okay, I'll say this, you know, don't, you never like to get, you know, someone get fired, all the like, cliche stuff, like it is what it is. But saying that, this was long, long, I've been saying this I know, for so I know. long, get mm -hmm. this guy out of here, like, it was just so clear he was not the right guy for the job. What's up, LF? Appreciate you coming through. But, like, it was just – he. it was so obvious he was not the right guy for the job, not only, like, in terms of, like, the production from the D-line, but, like, the chemistry that they had and, like, just how they respected him. We even heard stuff back in 2020 about this. And it was just, like, I think if anyone, like, listen to John Kimes' podcast from today, he went on, like, five minutes talking about, like, Every, like every, basically said every player on the D line has or had a problem with him at some point. Like, like basically like he said something like that. He said, like, even this training camp, they've been frustrated with him, like stuff like that. So it's just, I don't, I did not want him to be here. It's just very, very, very weird slash bad timing. Like, I don't know why you do like, why not do this before, like you knew okay. about, unless something happened, like, and it probably did. I think that's what happened. Trying um, to keep it on the low, though, Pedro. Yeah. They're, they're not trying and to reveal it. One other thing is, like, he just could not develop the Ferraris he had. Like, he had uh, – not Jonathan Allen. He had Montez Sweat, and he had uh, Chase Young, both super young guys, both guys that are athletic freaks, and guys that, like, were really just relying on their athleticism and, you know, getting production that way. Like, Chase Young and Montez Sweat – really weren't developing pass rush moves. So, like, that's kind of like, yes, part of that is on them themselves, but a lot of that is on the D-line coach, and he wasn't getting that done. And then, like, and you might – someone might say, well, you know, Jonathan Allen had his best couple of years. Well, that also comes from, like, the development he got from Jim Tom Sula before and him starting to implement that and him getting into his third, fourth, fifth year plus, you know. Um, so, I don't know. I'm – like, I'm not happy. Like, I, you, you know what I mean? Like, obviously, it sucks for him losing his job. But in terms yeah. of the commanders, I think this is positive. And I heard, like, like everyone's saying, like, this guy, uh, what's his name? Well, I, I forgot. Something Zig, uh, whatever his name is. Um, the, 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 def the assistant defensive line coach uh, uh, was promoted today, who is now the D-line coach. He really runs the practice for the D-linemen. And, like, I remember the first practice that I went to, I was like, who is that like huge, huge guy? Yeah. And it was him. Is it what's his first name? Is Je it Jeff? Jeff, Jeff Sigonina. Z G O N I N A. Yep. Yeah. And then also, like, I looked at his background. He played 17 years, won a Super Bowl, coached DeForest Buckner in um in uh, San Francisco, JJ Watt in uh Houston was with the Texans uh, before that as well, I think. Or no, actually, no, he played with the Texans before and coached with the Giants as well. So, like, I really like the guy's background. Seems like the players like him and respect him more than they did Sam Mills. So, I love the move. Should have happened at least last, like, in January or whatever, at least. Yeah. Um, and also, he – and general manager Martin Mayhew are the ones that have a connection with Warren Sapp as well, who we also saw out there at practice, who it wouldn't surprise me if he continues to be there out there at practice, you know, um, coaching up the defensive linemen, especially one Montez Sweat, Jonathan Allen, Deron Payne, and Chase Young when he comes back. But yeah, man, I, I agree with you. I, I know we actually even talked about this. I don't know if it was on my channel or your channel. I know we talked about your thoughts on Sam Mills and how he was largely responsible for the underperforming defensive line that we had last year, despite the four first round picks spent on that line. And I, I agree with you whole, wholeheartedly. I think he should have been fired a long time ago. It's weird in terms of the timing, but honestly, I think there was just a breaking point today at practice, whether it was an argument or a scuff or something that went on 
that well, Coach Rivera doesn't because Mills wasn't or out yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah, yeah, or yesterday. Um, that went on, and we just don't know about it. We might know more about it through reporting and stuff, but yeah, man, we need a guy like Sap, is what LF says. I mean, he brings the energy for sure. I, I think Jeff also brings the energy, though. Yeah, for sure. And I think Kyle said on this podcast, Sap's not going to be with this team. He he might like continue to do like guest appearances, but he's not going to be with like probably once the season starts, he won't be here. And then I think. You know, he's kind of said the same thing with Kerrigan. Like, probably this year, he won't have, like, a, you know, a specific role within the organization. He might show up sometimes. But, like, he kind of left the door open in terms of, like, he could be here someday. Um, what's up, Big Simple? What's up, Austin? The sport. So, that's definitely something. I think Kerrigan's more realistic than um, Warren Sapp. But I just still don't buy it with Kerrigan because, like, does it really – like, I know he loves football. Does it really make sense for him, though, like – He's, you know, he just retired, has three kids, and arguably assistant NFL coach probably requires more time than being an NFL pl a player. Not saying it's harder, just in terms of, like, the time per day during the season. Like, you got to not only, like, go to practice and everything, but you got to watch film on every player on your unit, everything like that. So it requires so much time, like 13, 14, 15 hours a day. And I just don't know. Like, he's made so much money. He had a great career. I think it would be uh, maybe, maybe he just loves football that much. No, bro. I get like, that. I get yeah. that. But I think that, like, I think it would be better for him to have, like, some sort of role within the organization, like something like Doug Williams had before where he's, like, player development, but, like, maybe a little bit more hands-on than Doug was because I never really felt like, you know, Doug Williams was really doing that much in terms of, like, player development. But, like, that some you know would make sense media would make sense for Kerrigan kind of like Logan Paulson who like is like he does a lot of media but he still talks to all the players and like he even trains players as well so like that's something I think would work for Kerrigan or more of like a mentor role like where he doesn't have to be there every day or he just has to be at the practices and not really do that much besides that because it's a lot of work yeah. yeah I mean I agree with you at the end of the day though if a guy loves football that much, I mean, there's only so much you can do to stop him from becoming a coach. I know he has a family. I think the one thing that will help, though, of course, with coaching, you travel all over the country. I get that. But the one thing I guess that kind of helps is that he already had a home. He already had, like, roots in this area. So maybe that might help, you know, spending half of the season in the area and stuff. But I agree with you. I mean, coaching is a lot. I, I don't know if you read, Pedro, the ESPN story on Sean McVay that I think was uh, – uh, released today, um, a little bit earlier today. It's really good. It gets you into the mind of a coach and like what it's like to be a coach in the NFL and how rigorous one's schedule can be as a coach and stuff. So I highly recommend it for everybody. I can even post the uh, the link a little bit later in the chat. But um, yeah, and obviously Sean McVay had, he, he coached here and stuff. So it was kind of cool hearing about his experiences in DC and being under Mike Shanahan and then Jay Gruden and stuff. So um, but yeah, Corey Lott here. Uh, WTF? Would they hire a coach that never played the game anyway? It really defeats the situation. But I think Pedro just talked about how the assistant coach Jeff uh, Gognia, Zagognia. Nobody can pronounce the last name, but uh, he coached or he played in the NFL for 17 seasons, correct? Yes, yeah, 17 years, and that, that's just insane. I think he's a seventh round pick, so to last that long, like he wasn't an amazing player. But like to last that long, like you just you got to be good and also like you got to be smart and be able to be a, like because I bet you the last four or five years of his career, he was probably kind of like a mentor to a lot of people and not as much of a player. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, and I'm posting the link right now in the chat. Um, it was a really good article. It's long, but like I read through it. It's really good. It's really good. But um. Okay, so we talked about the Sam Mills firing, but um, there's a lot of things to talk about tonight. But the next topic is Curtis Samuel, because he did say in an interview with Scott Abraham from Channel 7 Sports that he will, in fact, be ready for week one. And all of this side field time was just meant to ease him into the offseason program, which is what Coach Rivera has talked about over the last couple of weeks. But um, what do you make out of his comments during the interview and what kind of season should we expect out of Curtis Samuel? Do you think it will be a fully healthy one that 
will allow him to put up a lot of stats or like what, what kind of situation do you think we should see? Honestly, I have zero clue because like, it's just like, and I'm not believing anything that he says or Rivera says, honestly, like I'll, t- I'll, you know, consider it, but to believe it, it just, I don't know. Like, it's just crazy to me. And I know like people like get me like on me all the time, like, because like, I was like, Oh my God, like, I'm not going to feel good about Curtis Samuel until he plays week one. And they're like, oh, my God, he caught a touchdown in the FedEx field practice. I'm like, well, he also missed four practices in a row the week before. So, like, I literally do not care what he said. Like, I think last year he said he feels really good. At some points, Rivera at some point said, you know, he's never going to need surgery. He didn't have surgery when he literally had surgery, like, a little bit before that, like, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm just like, I don't know how we're still in this situation a year and like three months after the injury. And he has not, he, he's still, he's still missing games. And like, I don't know how you can feel confident about Curtis Samuel when he, he's still missing practices. Like people are like, oh, it's just Ron's plan. It's, you know, we're just getting him acclimated. Well, like, okay. But, like, he's not 100% if he's doing that. So, like, I think he'll probably be fine. But, like, I got to see it. And not even just one game. Like, I got to see it multiple games to feel confident about Curtis Samuel going, you know, through the season. So, yeah, you know, he can say what he wants. But he said stuff in the past, too, where he's like, oh, I feel good. I feel ready. Like, after the season, he's like, I feel better than ever. And then he's still not back eight months later, seven months later. Yeah, man, I agree with you. I agree with LF 100%. Got to, I'll believe it when I see it. Curtis Samuel, obviously he's a great talent. I mean, he's on the books for what, $13 million this year on the cap. Um, But, and you know, he could stretch the field. Carson Wentz is a quarterback that better plays to Curtis Samuel's strengths right, right now. But at the end of the day, we didn't really see too much Curtis Samuel last year. Like you said, Pedro, you kept talking about how, oh, he's ready. He's good. He's he's going to play next week. It, whatever, right? But it ended up not being a very productive season for him last season. And, you know, he's saying all the right things this offseason. But, again, I'll believe it when I see it. When it comes to Curtis Samuel, I want to see him healthy on the field. I want to see him part of the trio that we'll talk about right after this. But, um yeah, I think the jury is still out on him being a very productive receiver for us this season. I do want to shout out the command this podcast. Our boys who were on the pod recently. Curtis is a great white buffalo. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I appreciate the donation as well. Um, but we shall see. We shall see. Shout out to everybody that's rolling through the chat right now. Corey shout Lott, out. Roger Smith, um, Uptown Dre. LF, everybody. Appreciate up, all you guys Andre, for joining. Roger Smith, all you guys. Yes. yes, sir. Yes, sir. And speaking of the trio, how electric do you believe our starting trio will be? Terry McCorn, obviously. Jahan Dotson, first-round pick. And uh, Curtis Samuel. I think they'll be pretty elect- electric. I think, you know, Curtis will see, I think, if he plays, if he's fully healthy. I'm pretty confident, you know, what he can do. I think he can be like a 700 to 850, 900 guy. Um, you know, getting some rushes in as well. Jahan, I feel good about, honestly, like after seeing him, like, and I know he's not better than Terry because I, you know, he hasn't played a snap. Uh, Terry's a lot better than him. And yeah, but from what I've seen, Jahan has had more production in the practices than Terry has. And that just kind of leads me to like, originally, I thought it would be no issue at all in terms of like, terry and carson's connection like because like you know he literally met heineke and balled out with him or you know played okay on the same week um same thing with like garrett gilbert other guy <clears throat> sorry other guys but like he like he's still solid in the you know you know few practice i went to but like he's not like you know lighting people up and getting a ton of receptions like it's a quiet camp for Terry McLaurin, like even if you're you haven't been to a single practice and you're just going off of the tweets, like the last couple of years, you hear things about like Terry every day. Oh, Terry just made a huge play, you know, this and that. And like you're not hearing it this much this offseason. And that's I'm not questioning Terry McLaurin, the player at all. 
because I know how good he is. And I think it has more to do with his connection with Wentz. And, you know, they've only been practicing for two weeks. So, you know, I think that in the, they still got a month, a little over a month before the season starts for them to develop a little more. <clears throat> Pedro, I'll, I'll counter by saying I don't even think it's because of the connection. I think it's just because of the buzz that surrounds Shahan Dotson and the electricity that he's bringing out there on the field and how well his connection is with Carson Wentz or has been over the last couple of months. Um, I mean, Jahan Dotson is a stud, bro. I, I know we've talked about it off camera a bunch. He's a stud. I, I think Kevin Sheehan doubled down by saying there were people within the organization that told him that Jahan Dotson was the best receiver in this organization right now. Like that includes one Terry McCorn. So, and I know I saw you like the tweet as well. So I liked uh, it. I liked it yeah. so I could like, I have it so I can like go back to it. I should have probably bookmarked it, but I, I think just like, I don't know, it's just Kevin Sheehan. He's just a messenger. I think that's <laughs> completely ridiculous. Like, you know, Jahan could end up being better than Terry. The guy hasn't played a snap, man. He hasn't played. Like, how many players have we seen have great off seasons and then just terrible in the regular season or just like they're OK? And I think Jahan will be good. I think he will be very good. I am very very optimistic about him this year but to say like i think it's just clownish for like someone within the organization to say they think he's the best receiver right now maybe you could say okay i think that he has the more potential than terry or i think in three years jahan will be better than terry which is still i think a bold take but i like right now terry's the better yeah. receiver. like no, I that's, agree. that's just facts the guy hasn't caught jahan hasn't caught a pass yet so I agree. I mean, Terry is on the fast track of being the best receiver in franchise history, honestly, right? Like, not just stats-wise, but everything he brings to the table in terms of, you know, his catching ability, his route running, his deep threat ability, his leadership, all of that. So I, I definitely agree with you. I think it is a bold take to even say now that Jahan Dotson is the best receiver on this roster. I think maybe they're talking about, like, his hands, like, Maybe that's what they're trying to get at. Like he has the best catching ability, but and that, at the end I of the day, could, we haven't I could seen agree it. with Jahan Dotson has the best hands because I honestly think he has, in terms of like how he catches the football, he probably has better hands than Jahan or than Terry. But in terms of like everything else, like uh, winning off the line of scrimmage, you know, contested catch, like after the catch, stuff like that, like I think Terry's better, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, Watt Holmes with the, the funny comment. Uh, yeah, I, it's going to be tough, but I think beyond the trio though, I think, man, this yeah, let's talk. Can we talk about the other receivers? Yeah. I have yeah, like, a yeah. little bit of a bold take. So, um, okay, go ahead. also I think it would be an amazing problem to have, or not even problem, but like if we had to debate who's better, Jahan or Terry, that would be amazing. But, um, I don't think we're there yet, but so my bold take, <clears throat> it's not even a bold take because it's subjective. It's what I've seen during camp, but Deon or Dax Milne's been the fourth best receiver on the team. But, and, and I'm not, and you could say third, but like, cause Curtis Havis hasn't really played when I've been there, but I'm going to put Curtis at three. So it'd be, you know, Terry, Jahan, Curtis, <clears throat> and then Dax, like Dax has been really, really solid. Like I, he's not obviously going to be like a 700, 800 yard guy, but like, I think he can be a rotation receiver for you. And I think that's kind of what we thought he would be. Like last year, like during like he had a pretty good stretch there, you know, a few games where he was doing pretty well. And you're like, okay, maybe in a year or two, he can be a solid <clears throat> backup slot receiver. Um, and I think that's what he is going to be, honestly. Like from what I'm seeing, like he's working with the first and second team. Like Deami Brown, like I, I was hearing amazing things from like tweets and stuff like the first week. I have like the three, again, the thing is, I've only been to three practices. Like three is a decent amount, but also like there could be things that, you know, in those three that happen and you don't, don't happen in others. But, like he hasn't done much. Like the first day I was there, even just in like running routes with no DBs, he had like three drops. And then um, the second, the day I went yesterday, he didn't do too much because he was, um, he was coming back from the injury, but I still think he was, uh, you know, running routes and stuff. And then today 
didn't really see much. Like, I don't know if he had a catch or anything the like three days I was there. Maybe he had like a couple because I can't really remember the first day. But Dax Milne 100% has played better than him. And they're, they've both been playing kind of with either the first or second team. So Dax Milne has looked good. I think he will make this roster. Um, it's just a question of like, the thing is Cam Sims has such an advantage in terms of like being really tall. Like he's yeah. got the height where like, the other receivers, Terry, six foot, six one. Jahan Dotson's like five eleven. Only big bodied receiver. Yeah, right he's now. the only big body receiver. So he's a roster lock, I think. And also, he's a guy that probably is going to be active on game days because you need someone that's a little bit different, unless you kind of feel like Cole Turner is a little bit of a hybrid between the two, and you can line up line him up in the, you know as a receiver. Um, sometimes in the red zone is like similar things, but Dax Mills looked good. Cam's Cam's looked all right. You know, um, Diami's looked, you know, like they, they haven't popped Diami and, uh, Diami and Cam, but, uh, Dax has definitely popped. Like I saw like a 40 yard from what I could see yesterday because they were practicing on the opposite field. And not only that, but the linemen were all on our sideline. So it's very hard to see. But like uh, Dax Miller, like a 30, 40 yard catch from Carson Wentz. Today he had like three or four catches in the team drills. So, or in the 77, 11, 11. So he looked good. He looks good. And I think he will make the roster. It's just like, because I, Erickson, Alex Erickson, nothing from him. Like he's working but, with the uh, third team. I know, I know, yeah. I know what you're going to say. He, he's mm-hmm. working with the third team, not adding really anything as a receiver. And yes, you know, he is the punt, he's a returner and kick returner. But, like, Dax Milne, like, he obviously – he easily can be a punt returner. Like, he, maybe not as electric well, as Erickson. Exactly. Like, there you go. But there I don't need that. I do not need that in return. But the team might need that. The, the team, team might, might need, need that. that but um, I just – at this point, I don't think Milne is off the roster. Like, I think at – you know, it could be seven with Erickson being the seventh. But I think Milne's going to make the roster. We'll see. It's still early. They've still got a month into the season. We haven't played a single, like, even preseason game. So preseason things can game. change. But Milne's looked good, and then I think Erickson hasn't showed anything really. And Milne was also returning kicks and punts today. Um, so, And I think on the depth – we'll talk about the depth chart later. But yep. Milne was listed, I think, on the punt return depth chart. I think he was the second. And then kick return, yep. he was not listed, but he was doing it today. And then, honestly, like, you get, you can get – Danny Johnson, if he makes the roster, Jarrett Patterson. And I think kick returning is not as important as it used to be. You get the ball at the 25. So very few guys can get it past the 25 consistently. And then when they run it out, half the time, not half the time, maybe a third of the time, there's a penalty called. Uh, maybe, a, you know, every once in a while you get a fumble. I don't think it's even worth that much. But, of course, there's going to be some times where they just punt it or kick it to the three. So you need a guy. And Erickson has really, really good return stats if you actually look at them. So wouldn't be surprised if he made it. But Milne has stood out. And I you know, I don't think Cam or Diami are in danger of anything. I think they're going to make the roster for sure. Yeah. Um, Corey, a lot read my mind here with the question, how many wide receivers do you think will end up keeping on the 53-man roster? Like, in terms of my thoughts, I think there's going to be four locks. It's going to be Terry. Curtis, Jahan, and I think Diami's a, a lock as well, unless we find a way to trade him. I don't think we're just going to outright cut him or put him on the practice squad. So I think those are four locks. Um, but I do think because Cam Sims brings something different to the table as a big bodied receiver, as our only big bodied receiver right now, he has to be five. And then I have Milne at six. But I think the biggest question for me was whether they keep uh, seven receivers with Alex Erickson being that seventh guy. I don't think they're going to keep a Kelvin Harmon as a seventh receiver who doesn't provide you anything beyond, you know, some some nice catches on the field and stuff. He, he doesn't do anything as a returner is essentially what I'm saying, right? So I think if you're going to keep a seventh receiver, it has to be Alex Erickson. But there's also people out there who think we might just keep six receivers and Alex Erickson might be that sixth receiver. And, you know, well, maybe Dax Milne will be on the practice squad or maybe Cam Sims might not be on the final 53-man roster. Or you could look things at – you can look at things the other way, sort of like what you were talking about with having six receivers, but none of them are one Alex Erickson. So I, I think it's definitely a difficult question, definitely something that we could talk about right now in terms of how you see things being, but 
something that we won't really have ironed out until we actually see these players play on the field in these three practice, these three preseason games that come up. But I mean, I don't know if you have thoughts on who who will make the roster. <laughs> I think it's just like, I don't know. I don't see at this point, like, I think Dax is going to make the roster. Like if this, if the, you know, if they had to make cuts today again, cause it's still a month away or maybe like three and a half weeks from when they have to make cuts, but He's looked really good. I think it's going to be really hard for them to cut him. He made the roster last year. And so I think he also was, you know, he was drafted. He was drafted. So he probably has a chance to get claimed by someone, right? Like Alex Erickson, like he's not getting claimed. Like you you can stash him on the practice squad, sign him whenever you want. He's not. No, I, I just don't think anyone's going to claim him. Dax Milne, he's got a chance to get claimed. So I think. If I had to guess right now, I'd probably say six with Milne making it. And then if I had to give another guess, like as a second option, it would be seven with Milne and Erickson making it. I like what I see from Kelvin Harmon, though. I just don't think there's a reason and a, you know way he makes the roster. But he has looked yeah. really, really good. Like he's made a bunch of good ca- – like he's been one of the standouts from the three days I've been there. He's been really good, but like just doesn't really provide much upside. And like I think he's a perfect practice squad candidate, a guy that like you need if you need to call someone up for the game, like if you know you had a couple injuries, okay. <laughs> I saw Joel is coming. Um if if you if you need to call someone up for the practice squad or from the practice squad, he's a perfect guy. He's been in the system or he's been on this team. What is it? This is gonna be his fourth year, but three years with this will be his third year with Rivera. Um, and company, even though, you know, he was off and on last year. Um, that's a guy that you can, he knows the teammates. Like, that's a guy that's good for the practice one, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's going to be, it's definitely going to be interesting to see how things plan out. Um, I will say with Kelvin Harmon, you mentioned how he looked good during the three practices that you attended. He also looked good during the FedEx field training camp practice as well. He had some nice catches, but at the end of the day, Going back to what I mentioned earlier and what you just said, he doesn't offer you anything beyond, you know, some good catches down the field or some or a potentially good depth piece. Right. He's not really much of a return or anything. And at the end of the day, we all know Ron Rivera loves his position flex. <laughs> he says it all the time. So uh, Alex Erickson, if they end up going with the sixth or seventh receiver, he might be it. But um, it should be interesting. Dax Milne. Obviously, you mentioned him being second on the depth chart. We'll get to that a little bit later, but he, he's returning kicks as well. So he could he could definitely be that future brother-in-law, Dax Millen. Um do a little with the jokes. Do a little with the jokes. Uh, <laughs> I I wanted to get to this comment. You coming to practice tomorrow, Pedro? Nah, man. I got I went to the last Earth two. Out. And I mean it would be nice to go again, but I also like got like the picks and like signatures with who I wanted and like you know, I think I saw like, you know, what I needed to see. I don't think there's going to be that much more. And I think they'll probably go a little bit lighter tomorrow just because, I mean, who knows? They could go a little bit tougher, but I think tomorrow's our last practice before the preseason. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Okay. And the last question I want to get to before answering all these other ones in the chat from Ref the District, Roger Smith, others about the tight ends and the running backs. We'll get to that when talking about the depth chart, but – Last question I want to get to before then is should, and I know we'll both have separate videos on this after this stream, but should the commanders go after linebacker Roquan Smith from the Bears? Uh, I don't know. It's just because the like if it was just giving up, like say a first round pick and like Jamin Dave or whatever the heck it is, right? I'll be fine with it, but then you have to pay him as well. So it's not only that you are giving up a ton of draft capital, you're also paying him probably like you're going to probably give him the most money out of anyone or out of any line. Like he's going to be the highest paid linebacker. So I just like, is it worth it? I don't know. You think he's going to get, he's going to be the highest paid over. You think he's going to be the highest paid over uh, Darius or Shaquille Leonard? Shaquille Leonard. Um, I think, I don't know. It's usually when guys are kind I think, Leonard is better. I think Leonard and Fred Warner are better, but like usually the latest guy, if he's similar to, you know, the other guy, he'll get paid a little bit more. It'll, it'll be basically the same, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. I don't know if I'm willing to do that. I'm kind of in, like, if 
I honestly wouldn't mind like if it was a Jamin Davis package include like like just because like if you bring in Roquan Smith you're basically giving up on Davis in my opinion because you're just you 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 they say it they use it as an excuse all the time hey, and the fans do too why we don't need another linebacker oh we only use two linebacker sets so we don't need another linebacker we just need two linebackers well if that's the case James Davis is not better than Cole Holcomb He's definitely not better than Roquan Smith, so he would be he might getting, not even better. Be better than David Mayo. Yeah, so for all we know, he, he's not getting snaps if that's the case. So I think Jamin Davis would be required for me to do a deal. I'm trading Jamin Davis in that deal, and you know probably wouldn't get back much, but I think we could get back in terms of like obviously we're getting back Roquan Smith, but in terms of the value Jamin Davis would give. I think he's like a third-ish round pick. I think that's kind of fair, maybe a little bit more, just because like he's a first round pick from 2019, played out of position his first year, and he's, or 20, 2021, 2020, right? Yeah, sorry. No, no, yeah, so 2021. No. So he is still, you know, he's on a rookie contract. You get it for cheap if you if you feel good about developing him. They're rebuilding, so that would be something where like if and I know people are gonna be like, oh, you're giving up on Jamin Davis. No, I'm not. I'm saying. If we do a deal, Jamin Davis needs to be in that deal because if not, it's a wasted asset. Jamin Davis will be a wasted asset sitting on the bench playing like five, ten percent of snaps. But I don't know. I think I mean maybe make a call, see what it's looking like. But I don't know. I mean he's a great player for sure. I think PFF has him as like a forty-seven. It's like forty-seven uh, PFF grade, fifty-three, whatever. Like that's not the case. Um, he's a good player, but I don't know. It, it really depends. Like, what do you think the price would be for him? Yeah. So <laughs> a lot, we didn't even mention who might be next in terms of firings from this defensive staff. But I think, I think we both talked about that early in the off season, like Jack Del Rio is definitely on the hot seat. Um, speaking of, he was booed loudly at training camp uh, practice in FedEx. Uh, I definitely was one of the people who participated in that booing, but uh yeah, in terms of your question, Roquan Smith. Um, personally, I think you, you got to include Jamin Davis in the package. I don't think the Bears are going to accept a package without some sort of linebacker in return. So I think Jamin Davis will be included. Wouldn't surprise me if they asked for Deron Payne. Wouldn't surprise me. I don't know if the team is – well, I'm pretty sure the team is willing to give up a Deron Payne. Just no, but I don't think – I mean, maybe they w- – we would be willing – I think we probably would be willing to do it, but, like – what what's like the incentive for them? Like they're a rebuilding team. They're going to suck. They, especially trading Roquan Smith and you're going to have to pay. Dur- like the whole reason they're in this situation is because they don't want to give Roquan Smith top dollar. And they're not going to have to give drawn Payne, you know, 20 million a year, but it's probably honestly like, I don't, what, what are the top linebackers making around 18? I think 19. So yeah, 19, London is honestly, drawn Payne's probably going to be making close to that. I think, you know, two years, he's getting a de- deal two years after Allen. I don't think he's as good as Allen, but like you could argue they're in the, you know, similar tier. I think Allen's better for sure. Yeah. And he's, you know, a, you know, great leader, but like they're in the same tier. He's getting a deal two years later, probably going to be in that 16 to $20 million range. Right. So yeah. you're in that same situation. So I, I don't think they would be willing to give it uh, him up. And then also, or I don't think they would be willing to take him. And then also, I think that, like, I would try to keep Payne just because, like, I think he's going to be valuable this year. Contract year, if Payne feels like a guy that is just, like, really wants to get paid and is really going to ball out this year. So I think that is valuable, and you'll get a third-round pick from a compensatory pick if you play it right. I will say, so Payne, in terms of, like, Actual package, I think Jamin Davis in a second might be uh might work, or maybe a second and maybe a late round pick as well added into the trade package. I think that might work for Roquan Smith. Um, I do understand your point though about Deron Payne, like they're in a total rebuild. Uh, trust me, I've seen the Bears the last couple of years just living in Chicago, then just like tearing up their entire team, not really even uh providing a good supporting cast around Justin Fields. But yeah, I, I think it wouldn't make too much sense to sign a Deron Payne. When you're in a complete rebuild, you're trying to go super young. You're trying to go super cheap as well. So I, I get that point, but I think Jamin Davis, second round pick, maybe a fourth or a fifth as well. I think that might be worth worth it for 
uh, Roquan Smith. And then there's a point here from Motown Dre. I respect the point. Like, don't give up on Jamin Davis. Uh, keep your own talent development. Roquan Smith is, I mean, honestly, he's one of the best linebackers in the league. Um, like, for me, it's not as much as completely giving up on Jamin Davis as, like, improving your team mightily. And I think that's what we would do with Roquan Smith. And then there's everybody who talks about, oh, the salary cap. I'm sort of getting into my points. So I'll get into my video, but everybody talks about the salary cap. Oh, we're going to have to give Roquan Smith $18, $19 million per year, yada, yada, yada. We can work our way around the salary cap. The Saints did it. The Rams did it. I'm tired of being complacent. I'm tired of not putting all of our cards on the table. This is the third year leap that Coach Rivera keeps talking about that we're going to have, that we're going to get deep into the playoffs. We're going to do some good things on the field. Then why not actually solve the position that a lot of us fans, especially, have been talking about that this team needs to solve and, and doing it with one of the best linebackers in the league. I know you threw out the PFF grade, but I think the PFF grade doesn't do him justice. This is one of the situations where that, that just happens, right? But, like, in my opinion, I'm just tired of being complacent with things. And, like, I, I, I want to go – I want to go and, and put all of our cards on the table and really not just, like, pop in someone who might do a good job at linebacker, but pop in someone who's going to do a really good job at linebacker for years to come. This man is only 25 years old. He's just entering his athletic prime. I think he'd be a great player for us. And um, sure, there's the contract control with Davis, but at the end of the day, I would rather pay Rokon Smith big money than wait it out and wonder if you actually have something in Jamie Davis for the next couple of years. That's just me. Yeah. But like, I'm, I'm fine with, like, with whatever they do. I just think that ideally you don't wait until August 9th like you shouldn't yeah. be in this situation like i like and yes everyone whenever i say this is like says brings up the point they use to first off yes they use two linebacker sets and they only use three linebackers like 65 plays last year they're like and part of that is their defense but part of the, and part of that is like a new type linebacker. of defense yeah part of that is our linebackers are bums besides cole holcomb and you know, Jamie Davis has potential. Or at least like, playing like bombs. At least playing yeah, like bombs. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. They're playing like um, they were not playing well. Um, to put it nicely, they were not playing well. So like, they that's why they had to only put two on the two on the field and then put five defensive linemen or an extra you know DB. So I think that and also like you're one. I, I always say this: you're one injury away from playing David Mayo or Khalid Hudson 100 percent of the snaps, and I'm not. I don't feel good about that at all. So um, I think that, like, I would feel so much better even with, like, A.J. Klein in here who, um, you know, has been a starter with the Bills, has been also uh, not a starter, but, like, behind Matt Milano, Tremaine Edmonds, like, really good players. So he is a very solid player, knows the system. I don't, like, like, I sometimes I don't get Rivera because he loves, loves bringing in Carolina Panthers loves bringing in, even, loves even more bringing in former Bills. As if they were a dynasty, Panthers. bro. What? As if they were a dynasty. <laughs> exactly. And then the one position that we're like, we're like really desperate at, linebacker. There's a guy on the market that played for the Bills and the Panthers, knows your system, and is better than David Mayo by a decent amount. So I think that I don't understand why they don't sign him. Also, I want to get your take on this because I know you don't like Boss. I don't like Bostic either. But like, oh, oh why did you have to bring him up, bro? But Bostic or did, who's who's worse, Mayo or Bostic? That's the question. Bostic. I don't, I Bostic. don't know, man. This man's can't run, bro. He can't run, bro. That is true. He's like, but he has all the can't, muscles, but can't run, bro. Mayo can't run either, though. Uh, I mean, he did some good things for us last season, right? Yeah. Right. Maybe. Maybe some bad things though too, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, either either or. It's not a good, you know, it's not good to pick between those two. Give me AJ Klein. I think we can agree is better than both of those players. Oh, Tandre, are we sure we have something in Davis? Like, how, how can you be so sure, my guy? Uh, need to coach him and position him to thrive. Also, yes, it's on him as well. Remember, guys, like, throughout the offseason, I'd be one of those people who are like, you know, let's take a wait-and-see approach with Jamin Davis, you know. Like, you know, I, I'm sure he did not have the greatest of seasons last year, but, like, he did show some some spurts of greatness. Let's see if he can really showcase that over the course of the season. I've been one of those guys. So I'm not on the whole, like, 
anti Davis bandwagon. But like when a guy like Roquan Smith is on the market, I don't care what the Bears GM Ryan Poles is saying. Oh, we're not going to trade him, bro. We've seen across sports GMs talk about how we're not going to trade players and they end up trading him. Exhibit A, Juan Soto last week. But uh, <laughs> like we 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 we've seen those situations before, right? But at the end of the day, if a Rokon Smith, yeah, Russell Wilson. If a Rokon Smith comes up and he's on the market, why not? You know, at least try try to acquire him. I I really don't get it. I know all the people talk about the money and how we're gonna pay. We're gonna have to pay a lot of defensive players over the next couple of years. But I, I, bro, you cannot tell me these other teams can just maneuver around the salary cap and find a way to pay all I their think, players. I think like the one Saints. Of two things. One of two things, real quick. Either mm-hmm. our front office is not up to date or my theory my theory dan schneider's not liquid he doesn't have the funds to like turn things because the the way you create salary cap for the most part like you can do these prorated deals or what is it called the um where you add a year to the deal um you know what i'm talking about right yeah yeah i do know what you're talking about so you can do Uh, that maybe you can think of mm -hmm. it while i'm saying it or you can convert things to signing bonuses and then you just give them the money straight up. Well, if you're not liquid, you can't do that. And that's how like the saints do it all the time. That's how they create salary cap. That's how they see, create salary cap. And if you're voidable not liquid, years, what? Oh, voidable. Yeah. yeah. Voidable years, yeah. Washington does that, which is good. Uh, well, could be good depending on how you do it, but um, they, they don't, they have not, you know, yet to restructure deal while, They've been here, which usually I would say on average, a team probably restructures like two deals an off season and we haven't done it yet. So I think I'm just making that number up, but it's probably round two and we haven't done one yet. So I think honestly, it, yeah, he, that, that, that's true as well. But I, yeah, I just don't think he's liquid and that's, they can't do these deals when he, if he's not liquid. That's a good point. That's why I bring Pedro on the channel because he has insight like that. And with that being said, let's get into the unofficial depth chart. A good 47 minutes into the live stream. But uh, let me share my screen here so you guys can see as well. Um, Wait, I got one more rant, though. I got one more rant. So go ahead. I got so I was like, I tweeted out with no context. I'm going to pull up the thread here. I, 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 I tweet out, oh, Gibson is getting or Brian Robinson is getting the reps with the ones, right? I was saying, uh, you know, Antonio Gibson is not getting the reps with the ones. And then someone gets mad at me for like saying that. And they're like, oh, you guys all like to create drama. Like, I'm just saying, I was just saying what I saw. And then he's like, yeah, you're totally wrong. Antonio Gibson was listed as number one on the depth chart. I'm like, oh my God, give me a break. The depth chart, by the way, guys, scroll up a little bit. Look, the following depth chart is unofficial and compiled by commanders.com. So literally Zach Selby and guys like that are making this list. Maybe, maybe there's a little bit of insight from the coaches in terms of like, oh, what position a player is going to play. But like, this doesn't mean that much. So I wouldn't take, you know, yeah, it's just these unofficial depth charts aren't very, very important. In my opinion, that there might be some things in there, but in a few weeks, when the official one drops, that's when like okay, like we got some you know takeaways. But even then, it, they're not going to give everything away. Yep, I I agree with you there, and I'm trying to get it back up again. So yeah, I mean, again, like you just said, unofficial doesn't really matter. We haven't even hit preseason games yet, but. I just wanted to get your thoughts on, and I know you've gotten a chance to like look at it and stuff, but like, what are some of the biggest surprises for you on the depth chart? Um, and some of the most maybe like contested, heated, like positional battles you see playing playing out before the start of the regular season. Um, I would say the only one I'm kind of like, su- not even surprised, but like maybe I disagree. Yep. is Patterson being the second to last running back um, just because I think that – I like, I think Patterson has – I always go like this when I'm thinking about, like, who's they're going to keep on the roster, right? 
Jonathan Williams, he's not getting picked up by another team like immediately on waivers. Like that's how you got to think when you're thinking about who's making the roster. Like yeah. that, that cuz like there's no reason unless you have a position where commanders where literally only two players on their linebacking core would get picked up. Jamie Davis and Polk, <laughs> maybe Kali Hudson would get clean, claimed. Like but you know, then you still you still got to keep four linebackers because you got to have like five four or five linebackers on the team, but um, I think Patterson would probably get picked up by another team um, or would have a chance to, and Williams wouldn't. And I like Patterson a little bit more. And they both have looked pretty good, though. They've looked pretty good in camp from what I've seen. So I don't think it's like a terrible move to keep Williams. But I think if you're going to keep a fourth running back, you might as well keep Patterson, who's got a little bit more potential, in my opinion. And, yeah, but maybe they think Williams is more of like a guy that can get you 20-plus carries in a game. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you you read my mind, Pedro. That was there really weren't too many surprises on this depth chart, which is kind of surprising because it feels like every single off season when we get the unofficial depth chart, the first one at least, like there's always some like question marks, right? Like why why was this position group lined up the way it was? Why was this player ranked over the other? But I agree with you. The only surprise really that I saw on this depth chart was that Jared Patterson wasn't even among the four. Uh, the top four listed running backs um, wasn't a first string, second string, third string, or fourth string. Um, but I, I do think eventually – I you bring up a good point, though, because I always thought, like, if he wasn't going to be one of the four top four guys, then we'll just stash him on the practice squad. But at the end of the day, he just showed some good things last season to maybe merit, like, another team stealing him from our practice squad. And that's why they squad, kept so. him on the roster originally. Yeah, yeah, but – and I, I know he wants to play here. I know he wants to stay here. He grew up a, t- a fan of the team. And, I mean, from all accounts, like, he seems like a guy that wants to to be with this organization for a long time. But, yeah, I, I did I did want to note, though, that Jonathan Williams, I, again, went to the FedEx field practice on Saturday. He showed some really good things. He looked really spry, ran really good uh, between the tackles, did some th- good things as a pass catcher out of the backfield as well, which Carson Wentz might like this year. So, I kind of understand their thinking behind it, but I also, if we're just comparing, like you give me the option between Jonathan Williams or Jared Patterson as a, as a running back, I'm going with Patterson. Right. So I think that's like the difficult part about this whole situation. Like, do you want to go with a Jonathan Jonathan Williams who might provide you more on the backfield? Or do you want to go with a Jared Patterson who's more of a runner between the tackles? Although he could, he did show last year that he made some good catches out of the backfield as well. So it's a difficult situation for sure. Yeah, for sure. And, like, the only other thing, like, I, some fans might be, like, a little upset about is, like, Cole Turner being three and Bates being two. But I think people sleep on Bates. Like, I think Bates is very yeah. good as a – I mean, not very good. He's great as a blocker and slept on as a pass catcher. And I think, honestly, I would say maybe Samus Reyes being fourth. I think he should, like – he did nothing when I was there. Like, not a single mm-hmm. catch was made by him. And he is a better blocker than some of those other guys. But, like, Armani Rogers showed a lot more. I think, honestly, he seems like a guy that I think they could keep. Like, he could be the fourth tight end because he seems like he has a lot of potential just because he was a quarterback last year. And he's, like, you know, developing – he's switching – he switched positions. And he's already competing with these guys for roster spot. And, you know, he's got that, you know, speed and height that you want. I think he could possibly make the roster. He's been good. He's been good uh, making a lot of catches, had a touchdown catch today, I think in 77 or 11 v 11. He's been good, so I think he could make it. I would definitely have him over Reyes, I think, and Hodges. Not in terms of, like, not in terms of, like, what – I'm just saying what I've seen so far. Yeah, no, no uh, I was just going to ask Pedro, though. We're just going to skip over what Curtis Hodges has done? This this training camp period, like how how productive he's been, how surprising. Um, he's been. I mean, I think. Well, I I mentioned Hodges a little bit. I think that yeah. he's been solid. I've seen a couple catches from him, but nothing like Armani has stood out more than Hodges. But Hodges, you know, is more ready, probably maybe more ready, and he's a little bit bigger, maybe a little bit better of a blocker. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. And I will say, I mean, this wasn't surprising to me at all because I've been saying this will be our starting 
offensive line, Leno, Norwell, Rulier, Turner, and Cosme. But I know some fans, and I did see this on Twitter actually today. Some fans are a little pissed that Wes Schweitzer is second behind Turner and has not supplanted him as a starter. I don't know if you have thoughts on that. I think, and you know, Wes Schweitzer might be better than Trey Turner. He might be better than Andrew Norwell, but, and I probably don't think that's true, but I think that he's better. He's more valuable as a backup, as a backup because backup. he can play all three positions. You Let's say you start out with him as a backup. Trey Turner gets hurt. You put Wes in. Uh, Andrew Norwell gets hurt. You put Wes in. Chase gets hurt. You either put Larson in or you put Wes in. But let's say Wes is starting at left guard – or no, sorry, right guard. Then, you know, Andrew Norwell gets hurt. Then you got to switch west to left guard and Trey Turner to right. So you're switching two positions instead of just switching out one. So I think it's smarter. Even though west is probably comparable to Trey, I think that it's smarter to have him as a backup. Um, yeah, so that's what I would do. Okay, okay. I will say, like, C.D. Charles being the backup right tackle, like – how many offensive linemen do you think the team will keep this year? Because if it's what the nine that we kept last year, I think it was nine, right? The like nine, nine or ten. It's either nine or ten. Yeah. Or I mean, so I'm assuming, right? The first five, you got Cornelius Lucas, key backup six. Chris Paul, I think they're going to keep on the roster. I don't know if that's a hot take. I, I mean, we just drafted him seven. Wes Schweitzer, of course, eight. I mean, we're already at eight. Like, do you think Keith Ismail might be a guy that we keep? Larson? Tyler Larson? Tyler, I didn't say it, but you think Tyler Larson? I think Larson's Larson making it. Well, they're going to have to keep a backup center that's, like, strictly a yeah. backup. So, like, for sure, Larson or Keith, one of those two, they're going to make it. I don't think John Toth or Toth, whatever, I don't think he's making it. But I think either Larson or uh, Keith will make it because, like, even if you're going to say, oh, Wes is a, can play – well, if Andrew Norwell's hurt, he's and you know West is playing left guard, then there's no backup center. So I think that Larson will probably make it. Maybe Keith will. I mean, I haven't really paid attention to him. Uh, paid attention to him too much on uh, this, you know, training camps, you know, these sessions. But maybe he makes it over Larson. Maybe Larson starts off on the pup, and you put. Keith on this, you know, you know, put him on the roster because you're going to to start off the season. You need a backup center. So I think that you're going to have to keep Keith or Tyler and maybe Tyler starts on pup and you keep Keith and that just makes it easier for you. Yeah, that, that's fair. Um, I also think like sort of what I was trying to get into LF again, reading my mind. I, Bro, I think C.D. Charles is I don't even know practice squad potentially, but maybe even outright cut. Like, I mean, he hasn't ah, done anything. Here's the thing. I've been saying for a while that he's like a surprise cut, but then I always think back to, I don't think he's going to get cut because, like, he has the position flex. And if you look at the team, they have three tackles on the team. They have three tackles in Lucas, Leno, and Cosme. So you need more than one tackle. So – Sadiq can play tackle. So they're either going to have to keep Sadiq or keep, um, what's his name? Hill, who, where is he? Um, Rashad Hill or one of these guys right here. And honestly, I think it's probably Sadiq over Hill. Maybe Hill makes it, but I think like because he has that position flex, I just don't think you can start a season with only three tackles, like, right? Like, because if yeah. let's say Leno gets hurt or anyone gets hurt, knock on wood, hope it doesn't happen, but like it happens at least for a couple plays, probably if one of those guys gets hurt, then you put Lucas in as a starter, you don't got a backup tackle. So I think he's making it just because of that. But if they had another tackle, that's, you know, if they, you know, got another tackle on the team that was solid, I think he would make it over, um, Carl. That's fair. That's fair. All right, so we took a look at the uh the offense here. Let's take a look at the defense. Um for all the talk of David Mayo supplanting Damon Davis as a starter on the outside, Damon Davis is still here. First string. 
alongside Cole Holcomb. Um, again, no real surprises to me outside of the Jonathan Williams, Jared Patterson thing. But um, what do you make of the uh, the defensive group here? Um, yeah, I think there's really nothing to take away besides, like I would say, a little bit surprised. Well, one noteworthy thing is F.A. Obata being a D tackle. And then also that he's behind David Bada. That's a, I thought he was going to have more of a role this year as an end, maybe as a D tackle. Because I mean, he, he had sacks last season. Yeah, he had like the last two years, he's had like nine sacks. Uh, so he's got production. So, I mean, David Bada's had no production. He hasn't made a roster. Casey Tuhill, James Smith Williams haven't really had great production. And F.A. Obata's had the most out of all of them. So I thought he was going to, you know, be an impactful player, but I guess, I mean, who knows, right? Because this, again, unofficial depth chart, that was kind of the only thing that stood out to me on the defensive side. And also them listing him as a D tackle instead of a D end is another thing that um, is interesting, but that's really it on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah. And also another thing to keep in mind. So everybody loves to talk about how we have four first round picks as starters on defensive line. But then when we look at our depth, it's the complete opposite. We either have seventh round guys or undrafted guys, right? Like all yeah, besides over the depth. Fidarian. Yeah, for, besides Fidarian, of course. Yeah, but James Williams, Casey Tuhill, Will, Will Bradley King, Shaka Tony. I mean, Daniel, all these guys, bro, except for Fidarian Mathis. So I think that'll be interesting to I, see how it plays out, especially with one of those guys needing to be a starter this season on uh, at defensive end with Chase Young being out. Yeah, I was I was saying all off season before this, you know, free agency started, after free agency started, now that we needed another, we needed to add a veteran defensive end. I think that was something they needed to do. Melvin Gordon would have been good. Another guy, and anyone would have been good that you know has played NFL games, has gotten sacks. Like it just, I think, was needed, and they still haven't done it. And you know, it is what it is. And if if it works out. If it works out for all of them, great. If not, then, I mean, just remember I said it. And, like, I think also something that I always I kind of wanted to bring up as well, it's weird how, like, fans clamor for things for a while and they realize it for a while. And then Ron or whoever in the organization makes the decision, like, three months later, whatever. Like, Sam Mills, I think I was a little earlier than most people, but I think most people – we're wanting to have him fired over the last few months. Um, you know, since the season ended, and you Jamin Davis, of, yeah, Jamin Davis being middle of Will linebacker, Landon Collins. Everyone was saying for like a year and a half, he needs to be a linebacker. They don't do it, he sucks last year in the beginning of the season, and then they switch him over. A bunch of things like that is kind of like I don't know, it's just a little weird that you know, it takes him a while to make adjustments that fans were saying a while ago. And like, it's kind of weird. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just like yeah. if fans were saying it, if fans were seeing it and the coaches weren't, I don't know. Yeah. And speaking of Lennon, what's also weird is that he's still not on a roster. I mean, he's what, 28, 29. Like, I mean, sure. He's getting up there in age, but I mean, is that not weird, but that he's still not a roster on a roster, like period across the NFL and Eric flowers. But I would say, I would say probably Landon is more of like an ego thing. Like, I don't think he wants to see the tweet. Oh, Landon Collins signs a one-year deal for two point five million dollars or three point mil three yeah, million. Yeah, linebacker. Dollars. Yeah, yeah, three million dollars with the, you know, two million two million dollars in incentives. But if he if he if his agent gives the message out to Adam Schefter, you know, Adam Schefter will let the agent, you know write out the message and, you know, put line or put safety out. So if, if that's a problem with him, just, you know, talk to Adam Schefter. But um, yeah, I think that it's more of an ego thing with Landon because like he is definitely better than most people or than a lot of players on rosters right now, like uh, for sure. But, you know, he probably doesn't want to sign for the minimum or even so, like two, uh, three, four million dollars. Oh, no. And uh, we're starting to, you know, wrap up with the stream, but just a couple more questions here, Pedro. I, I do last like depth chart related question, but Percy Butler is the second string free safety. I mean, we've all remember what Coach Rivera was saying right after that we drafted Percy Butler. He was talking up Percy Butler and his role on our defense and how he believes he'll play a lot for us this season. 
Um, as the months have gone on, do you think that buzz has uh, gone away a little bit? Or do you still expect him to be a good player for us this season? What, what are your thoughts on Percy Belder? I don't know. I think definitely won't be starting, but I think he could get some snaps, you know, here and there at the Buffalo Nickel with Derek Forrest, who I think will be that guy this year. Um, and then he'll get some special team snaps as well. And then maybe as the season goes on, he'll get more and more kind of like Cam Curl. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, if an injury happens with Bob McCain or anything like that, then maybe he's a starter. But yeah, I don't see, you know, the the hype I think will be, he's, he's, a, he's one of the guys that they drafted that's more of a low floor, high ceiling guy. So I think it could take a little bit more for development for him, you know? So it could be next year where he really starts, you know, he actually starts for them or plays a lot, but he still could play this year for sure. Um, you know, he's kind of fighting with Derek Forrest for that Buffalo nickel when they do play. So, um, I, I, yeah, I like Percy Butler a lot, um, but yeah, they got a lot of safeties on the roster that are capable. Yeah. I just can't get over the fact that Chris Sims, a very good NFL analyst, um, for NBC sports talked about how Percy Butler, what was his best, uh, single high safety. I don't know how he worded it, but I mean, at least one of the best safety prospects in this draft class. And we got him in the fourth round. So, I mean, if that's the case, hopefully he gets some reps this season, but I do have two last questions to ask you, Pedro, uh, let me stop sharing. So the second to last question I want to ask you, where do the commanders rank in the division? Like where, how, I guess this is also a space for you to talk about the other teams in the division and what they've shown in training camp, especially when Daniel Jones, who still can't still can't throw passes correctly. But um, thoughts on the division where the commanders rank and yeah. So yeah, Giants definitely last. I'd probably say Cowboys. I I would probably say Cowboys first. I mean, like I just the uncertainty at, with the quarterback position for us. For the Eagles, like I, I once is going to be better than Heineke, no doubt about it. But um, I think that you still don't like feel amazing about it. Like you, I don't. Maybe some fans do. I know fans, some fans do, but I don't feel super confident about Wentz. Um, I feel super confident that he'll be better than Heineke, though, for sure. Um, and I don't like Hurts in terms of like I. I know you don't think this, but I think Wentz is better than Hurt. Like Wentz is better than Hurts right now. I know you don't agree with that, but like. What did he have? Like, I don't know. It's just not, you know, stats aren't everything, but 16 touchdowns, nine interceptions. Like they basically, if you, he has to rely on the game flow and everything, because if he gets behind in a game, it's, if he's forced to pass a lot, like I, you're not in a good you know situation. And Wentz has his faults for sure. And I think, you know, it's arguable. You can, you can, you can debate it either way who you take. But I think no, you can't debate that Dak Prescott's the best QB in the league, or not the league, in the division. Um, <laughs> oh, they're so, gonna clip that, Pedro. Uh, yeah, uh, definitely <laughs> best QB in the division. So I would probably put them at first, but I do think they got worse. I think they got worse. <laughs> so I saw that comment. I'd probably put Cowboys at one. I think the Eagles are overrated. Like I think that last year they kind of had a 2020 Washington moment where they played a bunch of bad teams at the end of the year uh, bad qbs for sure they played jake Fromm and daniel jones at the end of the year they played freaking garrett gilbert and almost lost they played taylor heineke and not even just taylor heineke but like so many guys out with injuries and we're one like we were in the red zone and heineke threw a pick um and where bates was kind of open and if he makes that we win and we make the playoffs which is crazy um so i think that I don't know. I'm kind of debating between us and the Eagles for second. I don't know. Maybe I'll say Eagles. If I if I could say tie, I would say tie. Um, but like, if I can't, I guess I'll go. He's gonna get the tiebreaker. I don't know. I mean, I, I think I think they're gonna be very similar in terms of their records. Like, I think the like Washington will be at like not. I would say nine, ten wins. I think is what Washington's gonna be at. I think Philly is in that 9, 10, maybe 11 win season. So, like, it's very, very small difference. I think three teams could make the playoffs from the NFC East, which people like to dog them so much. And everyone thinks the NFC East is so bad. And, like, they've been bad in the past. But, like, there's divisions that are worse for sure. AFC South is so much worse than us. Uh, I would argue NFC North might be worse. 
Um, you know, you got the Lions and Bears who aren't great teams. Lions, we'll see. Um, yeah. Vikings, you know, haven't been good the last couple of years. You know, um, and Packers yeah. have been, but I think they'll take a slight step down. And, you know, they haven't really had, you know, success in the playoffs, beyond, you know, beyond the second round. So I think that is arguable, you know, um, that division's arguable. And there's a couple others. So I think the NFC East gets unnecessary mm-hmm. hate because of that 2020 season where we won the division at seven and nine, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's fair. I, I will say, I I, de- I definitely feel like your anybody's thoughts on Jalen Hurts determines where they see the Eagles um, ranking in the division. Um, I think Jalen Hurts is the second best quarterback in the division. I've been saying that throughout the offseason, only behind Dak Prescott. Um, but the thing is, though, I'm not high on the Cowboys whatsoever. The only player that scares me on that team right now, and hopefully this doesn't come back to bite me later in the season, but the only player on the Cowboys that scares me right now is Michael Parsons. Obviously, we've seen what Michael Parsons did to us in both games last season. Um, but, I mean, they lost a lot of players on that defense, on that offense. I mean, what wide receiver do they have outside of uh, C.D. Lamb, at least to start the season? Michael Gallup's out, right, with injuries. I mean, I, I believe they just had a receiver, another receiver go down with an injury, right, this, this yeah. past week? Yeah, uh, what's yeah. his name? James Washington. Wait, real quick, I, want, I, I, I wanted to remember to ask you this. So how was it with Corey there? Because I saw some clips of you guys – like, you know, healthy debates and stuff. So how was it? Yeah, no, it was dope. Uh, it was dope just seeing a bunch of content creators for the first time in person. Like was Corey, it like that the whole time with you and Corey? No, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 bro. Like, uh, no, like, I mean, Corey, Corey's a good guy. He's been like... No, of course. I, of course. Basically gained a friend, yeah, through this through this uh, relationship, like on, on YouTube and stuff. But no, it wasn't the whole time. I will say there was a lot of back and forth about Matt Stafford as well. Um, because Corey has said some I heard that reckless stuff in the past about him being a mediocre quarterback. Um, and you know, there's a healthy back and forth around that. Um, the yeah, Carson Wentz, Jalen Hurts thing. I mean, he was he was hyping up Carson Wentz after one completion during a training camp practice. Yay! But I mean, <laughs> you saw the clip of that on Ed's channel. Um, but no, it was fun, bro. Seeing Ed for the first time, seeing Juan as well for the first time in person. I'm just blessed that, you know, I'm a part of this group in whatever way, small way I am. But like, yeah, um, next up is you though, bro. Next up is you, seeing you in person. Yeah, maybe you can come down to, well, at some point to VT. Me and Abdullah already talked. We're going to yeah. try to get a collab going the first couple weeks. Sure. So it should be fun. For sure, for sure. But um, yeah, I mean, on the division stuff though, I think where you and I differ is I see the Eagles winning the division. I think they're going to win 10 or 11 games. I think Jalen Jalen Hurts is – he's been settling and improving every single year. He's been in the NFL, and I think this year will just be another one in his improvement. And um, But I have the Commanders being second. I think we're going to make the playoffs. I think we're going to win nine games this year, nine and eight. But with how weak the NFC is right now, honestly, outside of the Rams and Bucks, and maybe you could put the Packers in it because for as much as they – downgraded from losing Devontae Adams. I think they upgraded even more on that defense. I think outside those three teams, who else? I mean, maybe the Eagles. Wait, who did you say? You said the Rams? The Rams, Bucks, and Packers. Okay, yeah, I can agree with that. And maybe you could – I don't know. 49ers are like a team where it's like – they're a boom or bust for sure. Like they could, yeah. they could win. I could see them winning seven games. I could see them winning 13. Like honestly, neither would surprise me. Maybe seven would surprise me a little bit because actually no, because I think Lance will be playing the whole season. Even if they're struggling, they probably don't want to pull him. Yeah, yeah. But at the end of the day, I mean, we saw the 49ers freaking made it, make it to the NFC championship game last season, even with lackluster play from Jimmy G throughout the season. So I think their defense, their offensive scheme, their running backs, Debo Samuel, George Kittle, I mean. I, I would definitely put them in the next tier after those. Like, I, I would put the Bucks and the Rams in, like, tier one, especially with Brady being back. And then I would put, like, the Packers in tier two. And then I will put the 49ers in tier three. And then everybody else below that. Maybe the Eagles and Cardinals in tier four or something like that. Um, us and the Cowboys tier five. Like, something like that. But the NFC is so weak, bro. It's so weak. 
So. Yeah, I agree. And like, imagine if Brady would have retired and Rodgers would have gotten yeah. traded or retired. Like, that would have made it even worse. And Watson yeah. didn't even get traded to um, the NFC either. Yeah, the NFC. Which is what everybody was thinking of, right? Like, I mean, you don't want to trade him in your conference, but I guess Texans were desperate, traded him away regardless. But yeah, guys, I think that's it for the live stream for tonight. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Roger Smith, metaphor. Roger Smith is still hating on Hurts. Just watch this season, my guy. Just watch this season. Um, Corey Lott, Uptown Dre, Big Simple, LF, Dubs Family. Shout out. Everybody. Corey Lott, shout it out, uh, Pedro as well. Um, everybody. I'm not getting to everybody. You guys are the district man in this podcast for joining. It's been a fun one. Pedro, is there any last things you want to say before we sign off? Nah, man, appreciate you having me on. And yeah, check out my channel, Pedro Schmidt, what you see on the screen right there. You can type that it on YouTube. And yeah, I just post a bunch, really, any commander's content you're looking for. It's on my channel. And also Pedro Schmidt YT on Twitter. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Make sure to include a link of your channel in the description. But with that being said, appreciate Pedro, it. thank you so much, bro. No problem for, for joining me on this live stream. It's always a great time chatting with you. And yep. go make sure to sub him up if you haven't already. And we and, might we uh, might get a um, stream going this week too. So true. get uh, yeah, just stay tuned for that. For sure on Pedro's channel. So make yep. sure you guys look out for that. And yeah, with that being said, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the DMV Sports Zone channel. Where I like to post fire content like this as much as possible. Also, go follow our Twitter page at DMV Sports Zone, Instagram page, all lowercase DMV Sports Zone, and our TikTok run by uh a guest in the chat and a co-host and a friend of pedro's now at bt abdullah so yeah thank you guys so much for watching and i hope you have a great night stay safe out there and see you on the next one two videos coming up peace